Good morning and welcome to Blackburn and Seafield Church. It's lovely to have you with us this morning and I hope that as we worship this morning you feel something of the Lord's presence and his peace. At least we're nice and warm this morning. Next Sunday we change our times. So if you are, so you would next week come at 12 o'clock. Okay, so we're changing the times from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 12 o'clock. <coughs> So it's 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock, so you'll come 12 o'clock next week and then 11 o'clock the week after. On Wednesday, we are starting our prayer group um, here in the church from 11 o'clock for about half an hour. Everyone is welcome to attend. Um, there'll be some times of reflection, there'll be some music, there'll be some, a scripture passage and there'll be some time for individual prayer um, and we'll also have a prayer list here in the church as well. So if you'd like to come along, please just come at 11 o'clock. Like here, you've got to wear your face mask and sit remotely, but um, it's a start at something else. Also on Sunday the 13th of September, which is in two weeks time, we will have our Harvest Thanksgiving service. Uh, we will be focusing on Christian aid, which we'll be looking or talking about our global uh, neighbours and how we can love and care for them. Standing together, really. Um, if you would like to bring any food stuff for that, we are supporting the Trussell Trust, which is the food bank. Um, and as you leave today, there will be a wee leaflet like this, and it tells you the food stuff that you can bring. So if you would like to bring any food stuff, we will also have envelopes for Christian aid as well. Um, if you would like to bring, um, you can take them away and fill them and bring them back the following week. Um, there's no problem with that. So that's Harvest Thanksgiving on Sunday the 13th of September. It is with sadness that I intimate the death of Mr. Tommy Dalzell um, from Turf Place. Um, his funeral takes place on Wednesday. And also one of our own, Mrs. Linda Campbell, Mrs. Linda Campbell from Elm Park, um, whose funeral takes place here in the church um, on Thursday. But because of numbers, um, if you could just keep her in your thoughts and prayers at quarter past three, um, that would be um, that would be greatly um, helping. Here we gather, O oh Lord. Test my heart and mind. Try me and prove me. Here we gather, O oh Lord, trusting you without wavering, walking with integrity. Here we gather, O oh Lord, singing in our souls with thanksgiving, telling of your wondrous deeds. Here we gather, O oh Lord, in the house which we love, in which you dwell. Here we gather, O oh Lord, let us worship you in the place where your glory abides. Let us worship God together. We remain seated to listen and reflect on him 510. Jesus calls us here to meet him.
just pray. God, you are solid, sure and reliable, while at the same time being creative, adaptable and free. We change too, but not always in a good way. We catch sight of something new and life-changing in the teaching of Jesus and we vow to be different, to follow him forever. In the kaleidoscope turns and a new picture emerges, one that involves cost and letting go, one where people don't come flocking to hear what we have to say, but are hostile or worse, still indifferent. A future that holds the real possibility of dying, and we are not ready for that. Gentle God, help us to take things a bit more slowly, to get our balance and find a way of following that is sustainable for us and honouring to you. May we neither shame ourselves by dwelling on all the mistakes we have made in the past, nor frighten ourselves by looking too far into the future. Help us rather to take one day at a time, to keep going by putting one foot in front of the other, lifting our eyes now and then and surprising ourselves to see just how far we have come. And if the way for a while is easy, let us enjoy it. And if suffering comes, give us strength to be it. And in both, remind us that you have been there before and have promised to stay with us to the end, which may, if the impossible promises of our faith turn out to be true, not to be the end at all, but a glorious new beginning. So in this moment of silence, we bring to you those things and ways in which we have let you go. Forgive us, Lord. Keep us faithful. Keep us hopeful. Above all, God, keep us going in Jesus' name. And hear us as we say together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite Sam Mary to read our scripture lesson for today.
Amen. And may God God's blessing to us and give us the most holy love. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have taught us that your word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. Help us to listen for your word and take it into our hearts so that we may come to know you more fully, love you more truly, and follow more faithfully in the steps of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forevermore. Amen. Have you ever had a setback, a defeat, been in a right mess? Have you ever snatched failure from the jaws of success? Playwright Oscar Wilde once commented after a disastrous opening night that his play was a great success, but the audience was a failure. Well, that's one way of handling defeat. Winston Churchill had the same ability to spin a setback into something else. He was once asked, what most prepared you to lead Britain through World War II? His reply, it was the time I repeated a class in primary school. His questioner then asked, you mean you failed a year? Winston Churchill straightened himself up to his full height and replied, I never failed in my life. I was given a second opportunity to get it right. That's the way to handle defeat. Look at it as a second chance to get it right. Simon Peter knew about second chances. You'll remember from last week that Jesus and his disciples were in the region of Caesarea Philippi when Jesus asked them, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? I am Simon Peter. And it was Simon Peter who answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus heaped on Simon Peter words of profound praise for his answer. Good for you, Simon, son of John. For this truth did not come to you from any human being, but it was given to you directly by my Father in heaven. And so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock, and on this rock foundation I will build my church. Today's lesson follows that rapturous scene. Matthew tells us that from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he will be put to death on the third day, but raised to life. At this, says Matthew, Simon Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine anyone rebuking the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Simon Peter has proclaimed Jesus as the Messiah, and he's rebuking him. God forbid it, Lord, he said, that must never happen to you. Well, we know what happens next. Jesus turns and says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. What a turnaround. It takes Simon Peter only seven verses to go from being a law on which God will build his church to being the voice of Satan tempting Jesus to avoid the cross. That is one of the great things about the Bible. There is no effort to clean up these stories. There is no attempt to make biblical characters more holy than they were. One moment Jesus proclaim, eh, Peter proclaims Jesus as the Messiah and the next moment he's telling Jesus how to go his work. One moment he is in the garden defending Christ with a sword against a Roman soldier, the next he is standing outside the palace where Jesus is being tried and denies that he ever knew Jesus. One moment he is hiding as his master is being crucified and the next he is proudly proclaiming Jesus' message 
the thousands of listeners on the day of Pentecost. This is Simon Peter. Even more important, however, is the truth. We are Simon Peter. Up and down, in and out, defending and denying, that's us. We can deny and we can identify with this fickle disciple. When he looked back on it later, Simon Peter probably regretted trying to correct Jesus. But we all say stupid things from time to time. We all jump in there with two feet. Maybe I'm speaking just for myself, but I suspect it's part of the human condition. It's like the group of students in Italy they were standing just inside St. Peter's Basilica, the largest church in the world. The tour guide, tour guide explained, this church is so large that no man on earth could hit a baseball from one end to the other. The group stared in silence at the beautiful marble sculptures, intricate paintings, the glorious mosaics all around the enormous building. Then one girl interrupted the silence with an astonished question. You mean they actually let them hit baseballs in here? Okay, she might be thinking she's been silly, but all of us um, have blurted out marks just as clueless. Simon Peter rebu rebuked Jesus. The truth is that Peter cared about his master. He didn't want him to suffer and die. But something else vexed Peter. How could the Messiah be put to death? That didn't make sense. Peter was impetuous and a little impertinent in his rebuke of Jesus, but he was being quite honest. God forbid it, he said. That must never happen to you. As usual, Peter was probably saying what the other disciples were thinking. If we are honest about it, there's a lot about our faith that bothers all of us. If that isn't so, why are we not turning our community upside down with our passion for the gospel? Why are we so apathetic in our witness for Jesus? Because we are like Simon Peter. Before he was confronted by the risen Jesus. Sometimes we are up, sometimes we are down. Sometimes we are convinced, other times we are confused. Sometimes we are soldiers in Christ's army, at other times we are missing in action. Thank God for grace, because none of us merit salvation. As Jesus confronted Peter about his impetuous comments, he spells out what is facing those who give their lives to him completely. Jesus says to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must desire themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their own life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. There was once a Roman Catholic church which was broken into twice. In the first event, thieves got the money box. Three weeks later, vandals escaped with something much more puzzling. Being a Catholic church, there was a large crucifix. The thieves had unbolted the four foot long, 200 pound plaster Jesus from the crucifix, but left behind the wooden cross to which it was attached. The church officer confessed his bewilderment at this. They, uh, they just decided, we're going to leave the cross and take Jesus, he said. We don't know why they took just him. We figure, if you want the crucifix, you take the whole crucifix. But we know why, don't we? Many people would like to have Jesus and leave his cross behind. Jesus represents forgiveness and grace. Jesus is a divine friend who accepts us as we are, hears our prayers and helps us in time of need. Who wouldn't? want Jesus. But his cross, on the other hand, represents discipline and self-denial. The cross represents service and sacrifice. 
the cross represents taking our eyes off ourselves and putting them on those for whom Christ died. That's an entirely different matter altogether. We want Jesus, but we're not sure about taking up his cross. We remain seated to reflect on him 392 when I survey the wondrous cross. student minister served time in a church. He encouraged the people to do what he believed Jesus called all Christians to do, to reach all out to all people, including those who are different socially, eth ethically and economically. And some of those people began to attend church. But then some of the more influential church members began to be concerned because these people who were attending their church so the minister said, well, this is what the Great Commission says that we are to do. He was saying to them, this is our mission. This is our responsibility. Jesus told us to go out and make disciples of all people. This minister received such opposition to the whole idea of reaching out to all people that he put the Great Commission to a vote in his church. Do we support it or not? That sounds a little comical to us voting on Jesus' direct command to his church to go out and make disciples of all people. It sounds like Simon Peter admonishing Jesus and our lesson for the day. But that's what they did. And can you guess what happened? The church actually voted against the Great Commission. So we're not going to do that at all. And another minister heard this, and he just shook his head in disbelief. But then he realised that there are churches everywhere who have already voted against the Great Commission by their inactivity, by their apathy, by their attitude towards anything spiritual. There are people who call themselves Christians around the world, starting right here in our own community, who have already voted against the Great Commission by their don't care attitude regarding our responsibilities for service in the kingdom of God. Yes, those thieves are not the only ones who want to take Jesus, but not his cross. And that is our temptation as well. Peter backslides in a hurry when he was first confronted with the message of the cross. And often we will too, but fortunately, that's not the end of the story. Peter had an encounter with the risen Jesus and the man who had been a fickle reed became a solid rock of faith and service. 
And that can happen to us too. And Emily tells a moving story from his childhood. He was taking a train trip with his parents. On this trip, he noticed a porter moving about with a terrible limp. The porter told young Alan that he had an ingrown toenail. A chiropodist had worked on it the previous day and it had become infected. Obviously, he was in great pain. They talked about other things and Alan went to bed. During breakfast the next morning, Alan's father commented upon the way the porter appeared to be in pain and Alan filled, Alan filled them in on the reason. After breakfast, Alan went back to the carriage, returning to their car half an hour later to see the porter coming out of his parents' room. As the porter walked towards him, Alan saw that the porter was distressed. Great tears were falling down his cheeks. He went into the lounge and sat down, put his hands over his face and cried. Alan sat beside him. He was particularly concerned because the porter had just left his parents' room. He asked, are you crying because your toe hurts? The porter said, no, it's because of your dad. He went on to tell Alan that his father had approached him to ask about his toe. His father told the porter that he was not a doctor, but he felt that he might be able to help him. The porter was reluctant, but at his father's insistence, he went to their room and showed him his toe, terribly inflamed and swollen. Alan's father suggested he lance it and clean it out and bandage it to relieve the pain and help the healing. The porter agreed, and as he told Alan, he burst out crying again. Alan asked, did it hurt that much? He said, it didn't hurt at all, and it feels fine now. Then why are you crying? Alan asked. Well, said the porter, while your dad was dressing my toe, your dad asked me if I loved the Lord. I told him that my mother did, but that I didn't believe as she did. Then he told me that Jesus loved me and died for me. As I saw your dad carefully bandaging my foot, I saw a love that was Jesus' love, and I knew I could believe it. We got down on our knees and we prayed, and now I know I'm important to Jesus and that he loves me. With that, he started to cry again, happy and unashamed, when his sobs subsided, he earnestly burst out, You know, boy, kindness can make you cry. Well, kindness can make us cry, but that is part of what taking up the cross of Jesus is all about. We love as he loved. We don't try to cancel the great commandment or the great commission. We try to lift them out. Oh, we get it wrong sometimes, just as Peter did. But by God's grace, we pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and even more importantly, we hoist the cross back on our shoulder and we try to live as Jesus lived. That's who we are. That's what we do. And in all things, we give God the glory. Are we ready to hoist the cross back on our shoulder and try to live as Jesus lived? Amen. Let's dedicate our offerings and come before God in prayer. Let us pray. What good is it to anyone, Jesus asked, to gain the whole world and lose their soul? Wise and generous God, we bring you our offering, be it a widow's mite or a king's ransom, that it might help the church, but in the economy of the kingdom, it could count for nothing. Such money as we do bring is only of real value if it represents a letting go of all that binds us to this world, and in, do in so doing, sets us free to follow Christ and to commit ourselves more fully to the service of his kingdom. Living God, we view you as Christians through the lens of Jesus of Nazareth, a man who experienced more and achieved more in his tragically short life than most of us will if we lived to be a hundred. 
If it's true that you were present in him in a uniquely powerful way, his thinking completely in tune with yours, his life filled with your spirit, then we can look at him and see you in a new and different way. Not separate from human brokenness and suffering, but one with us in our loss and grieving, as well as in our wonderment and joy. We pray for all those today who are going through the long, slow journey of loss and grief and recovery, and that means all of us in one way or another. The announcement of bad news, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. We pray for those who have recently received the kind of news that all of us dread, news of a serious illness or redundancy or the loss of a loved one. And we pray especially for the family and friends of Linda Campbell and Tommy Dalzell. Be with them on the road that they must travel from here on in. And for those who have to break bad news to others, may they receive the care and support that they need. There is the immediate, instinctive denial. Never, Lord, that must not happen to you. Sometimes, Lord God, it's just too much to bear. We pray for those who have been assaulted with loss on a scale that no one should have to face, or those whose back has finally broken under one last tiny straw. May there be ears to listen, arms to hold, hearts to understand until they are ready to face their truth and take the first small step forward, even if that leads to the anger, the looking for someone to blame. Get behind me, Satan. Forgive us if we have lashed out in anger at someone who did not deserve it because they are voicing our own thoughts or just because they are close by. Grant us compassion and broad shoulders if someone needs to vent their wage on us. There is the bargaining, the going of deals, the doing of deals, the desperate search for hope. If you are willing to lose your life, you will find it. May we move quickly from false, futile deals with the universe to this real, honest deal with you. Help us to let go of whatever it is we are most fearing, most fear of losing. Then no one can take it from us. Help us as quickly as we can, as slowly as we need, to reach acceptance of a new and different future. The Son of Man will come in his glory and you will see him. God grant hope to all who are in despair, or someone to hold a candle of hope on their behalf. Until, it light, until its light reaches through to warm and encourage them. We pray for all the migrants in the English Channel and the Mediterranean Sea, the refugees here in Scotland, all who long for a better life and are prepared to risk their lives to get it. And in this moment of silence, we pray our own prayers. surround them and us in your loving arms and grant us your healing and your wholeness. God who knows from the inside what it is to be human with all the joys and sorrows that entails, bless us and all those we pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 533. Will you come and follow me? If I would call your name.
table, will you please stand? Continue your walk with Jesus as you leave our time together. Whatever the burdens are that you carry, know that Jesus shares your load. May God's love, Jesus' compassion, and the Spirit's guidance be with you as you go about your daily life. And the amazing grace of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, the unconditional love of God, our Heavenly Father, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, now and forevermore.